Monarch butterflies are one of the garden's most recognizable creatures, famous for their bright colors and their epic annual migration from southern Canada and the United States all the way to Mexico. But did you know that the monarch has evolved closely with this plant, the milkweed, named for its milky sap, this toxic milky sap that's emitted when the leaves our, our stems are damaged. Today we're going to investigate the intimate relationship between these two fascinating species and look at some of the many members of the milkweed family that you can grow in your garden. There are about 115 different species of milkweeds in the Americas. Most of these are tropical, but the most common one here in the eastern United States is common milkweed. This is Asclepius syrica because uh, Linnaeus, who came up with our system for naming plants, mistakenly thought this was from Syria. But you know, as we said, this is the plant that exudes its milky sap. Uh, flowers appear on this plant in June. They're in, in pink clusters, dense clusters, really highly fragrant, uh, and they're followed by these green seed pods. These seed pods will age to brown each with a, uh, 50 to 100 seeds in each one, and each with its own little parachute to help disperse it by the wind. Common milkweed can be weedy, and it can reach five feet or taller in height. But this is butterfly weed. This is Asclepius tuberosa, famous for these clusters of orange flowers, and it's a staple in butterfly gardens. This is a showy native perennial. It's cold hardy, tolerates poor soils, long-lasting clusters of these uh, orange blossoms bloom from June all the way through August. Butterfly weed is an important nectar source for monarchs. Remember, this is one of the milkweeds that does not exude a milky sap. However, monarch this is an important food source for monarch caterpillars uh, as well as for the nectar. And they develop these very finger-like uh, seed pods that have the same system uh, with the little parachutes to disperse the seeds by the wind. If you spot bugs on your milkweed, it's most likely milkweed bugs or beetles. And you can tell the difference because milkweed bugs feed on the seed pods, as you can see here. And they have that same orange and black markings that you find on the monarchs. And that's called apoestic coloration to warn predators that it's toxic and distasteful. So the milkweed bugs feed on the seeds inside the ripening pods while my milkweed beetles feed on the leaves and the sap itself. I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the milkweed beetle. Remember, that's the beetle that if you see the orange and black beetle eating the leaf, that's how you know it's the beetle and not the bug. And I've got one in here I've captured, and I wanted to show it to you. And notice it has really long antenna on that beetle. Same apoestic orange and black markings. This is such a cool insect though. I want you to try this when you see one. Look for the long solid antenna, not segmented antenna. Cup it in your hand, hold it up to your ear. You will not believe it. It pops and squeaks and it's amazing. Now let's take a look at the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Uh, remember that monarchs begin to appear in the upper Midwest in, in the month of June. They'll go through uh, three different uh, life cycles during that period because they live for about a month and that would be in June, July, and August. So we'll have three generations after that first uh, monarchs that fly up from Mexico in June appear here. And those first monarchs are laying eggs on our milkweed. They're attracted by the nectar uh, and they feed on the nectar and they lay their eggs usually on the underside of the leaves and they'll be these very teeny tiny chartreuse uh, eggs. Usually they'll lay one on, uh, on each leaf. They hatch after about four days. Once they hatch, that teeny tiny caterpillar will eat its egg casing because it has a lot of uh, nutrients in it and then begin feeding on the leaves. Uh, if there's more than one egg on a leaf and one hatches first, in fact, they'll eat the other egg, thinking it's an egg case. Also, uh, keep in mind, at this stage and the er early larval stages of the monarch, uh, 
Um, they, there are a couple of predators that uh, can still eat them despite their toxicity, and those are wasps, uh, 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 wasps and spiders, uh, so keep that in mind. So anyway, uh, after they hatch, uh, and I'm going to show you these stages here, we've got some we've been raising here, and I can show you some of the stages they're going through. Uh, but after they hatch, they'll go through over a two-week period about five morphs, moltings, and they, what they'll actually do is shed their skeleton. They'll back out of the skeleton, and it'll become like a cowl around their neck, and they'll, they'll either eat that or let it drop to the ground. So they'll go from a tiny butter, uh, uh, a caterpillar to a big, fat uh, caterpillar, and we'll take a look uh, at the ones we've got here. Um, and you can see... I've got three nice size monarch caterpillars in here. And for over a two week period, I'm gonna be feeding them the milkweed, which is that toxic sap is being absorbed into their body that will stay in its body for its lifetime, even as a butterfly. And after about two weeks, they'll start to slow down. It was, it's almost as though it's going into uh, 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 hibernation. And eventually it'll find a high point uh, hang from the bottom of a leaf and make the shape of a J. It doesn't take very long. At this point is when you want to keep an eye on them because it's about to turn into a chrysalis on its final and fifth molt. And I've got two of those chrysalises right here. That happens in a very fast process. It only takes about 30 minutes, so you want to keep your eyes out for it. Uh, and uh, these chrysalises uh, aren't necessarily going to be found on the milkweed. They may be on a companion plant or a plant nearby uh, taking advantage of the camouflage. So remember, they've gone from having their apoestic warning coloration to full camouflage coloration. Also, when we look closely at the caterpillars, you'll notice that they have antenna at the front and the back. Those actually aren't antenna at all. Those are tentacles, and they are, in fact, sense organs uh, for the caterpillar. Remember, if you're looking for uh, monarch chrysalises, sometimes you may not find them on the milkweed itself, but on a nearby or a companion plant. And here you can see we found a chrysalis right here on this Joe Pye weed. Um, this will stay here for about two weeks, and during that period, it will slowly get darker. That outside shell is actually becomes almost translucent, and you can actually see the wings of the butterfly itself. Um, also, if you get close and note, around the rim of that chrysalis, you'll see little iridescent gold dots. Uh, and scientists think that that's because it helps diffract the light and look resemble dewdrops from predators that may approach from below. As we mentioned earlier, milkweed plants are critical for monarch populations. In the last 20 years, monarch populations in North America have diminished by about 90%, mostly because of agricultural use of herbicides. So uh, that's one, really one important thing to keep in mind throughout all of this. But also, I want to talk a little bit more about the adult stage, the butterfly stage of the monarch caterpillar. Um, uh, it, 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 as a reminder, that chrysalis stage lasts for 9 to 14 days approximately, and slowly in that very last stage before its final molt into that chrysalis, uh, the, the caterpillar will slow down, become very sluggish. Eventually it'll reach up to a high place and drop down and form a J shape. Uh, this happens right before that final molting. It takes actually just about two minutes for that final molting to take place. Um, and that's when it becomes that smooth jade green chrysalis uh, with the gold spots that we were looking at earlier. That chrysalis stage lasts for about 9 to 14 days, uh, but the day before the butterfly emerges, that chrysalis will become transparent. You'll actually be able to see the butterfly wings, the black and orange wings, through that uh, transparent chrysalis. Um, after about 15 minutes, the butterfly will begin to emerge from the chrysalis uh, and the wings will actually be fully expanded, but it will take a couple of hours for them actually to harden and dry before the butterfly can uh, actually fly. And their body temperature actually needs to reach about 66 degrees before they can fly. Um, if you notice, you'll see that the monarch's wing veins are deep black against that burnt orange background. Uh, it's visible whether the wings are open or closed. Uh, and if you look very closely, you'll see large and small white dots are sprinkled around the edges of the wings and all over the monarch's black body. Uh, 
Um, if you look closely here, you can also see the difference between the male and the female. If you look at the image above, you can see that the female butterfly is not, does not have the two distinctive black spots that you'll see on the hind wings here that you can notice on the male butterfly. A uh, fun thing for you to notice for uh, when you're observing the butterflies to know whether or not that'll be a female that'll eventually be laying eggs in the garden uh, or not. Um, do you, you do notice that the monarch's orange color is much more subtle when the wings are closed. Um, so uh, another thing to keep in mind. So uh, we'll go through typically, as we said before, three or four generations here in the upper Midwest, uh, uh, four full generations. That last generation, that's that remarkable thing that takes place. That last generation in August or early September, when that uh, monarch uh, butterfly emerges, that butterfly goes on a long journey. And instead of just living for about a month or so, these monarchs will live at least eight months. So they will fly all the way down to Mexico, over winter down in Mexico, in the spring, come out of their hibernation and take off and begin their migration back northward again. So that's that re most remarkable part that we all uh, are amazed about, but it isn't one generation, it's actually multiple generations that take place uh, here in North America um, before we get to that stage. Keep in mind, if you're watching for monarch butterflies, sometimes you may see them a monarch that is actually tagged. And that's probably an effort by a group called Monarch Watch. You can find them online. It's a group that monitors populations of monarchs uh, and are tracking their movements. So when you see that tagged, uh, Monarch, you're encouraged to contact them and list it uh, on their online resources for folks to know where these uh, monarchs have traveled to. So keep in mind, uh, every once in a while you may see, like you see in this image here, a monarch that may actually have a little tag on it, and that's what you're looking at. So uh, I also want to talk more. Let's. I want to jump in and let's talk about some of the different uh, uh, species of milkweed. As we mentioned, there's about 115. We're going to cover eight of them a little bit more in depth today, ones that you'll find most commonly here in North America. Uh, keep in mind, it's always best to grow the milkweed that's native for your region. That means it has evolved where you live. Uh, most m milkweeds grow best in full sun, but they will tolerate some shade. Uh, that's with the exception of the swamp milkweed, which we will get to in a minute, which prefers moist, rich soil. Uh, milkweeds do thrive in poor dry soils and disturbed areas, fields, and ditches. They tend not to be a typical prairie plant because they do prefer these recently disturbed areas. And keep in mind that milkweed plants do have toxicity. So uh, be aware if there's some place where livestock can get to them or children can get to them because they are a toxic plant. Uh, another interesting thing to take note of is that the tropical species of milkweeds tend to have higher toxicity than the northern species or our hardy species. And what birds do not know is that those northern monarchs feeding on the milkweeds up north have very relatively little of that toxin uh, in their abdomens or in their bodies and probably would be edible to some birds. But the more southern butterflies accumulate much larger amounts of these compounds from the tropical milkweed species and these are in fact more toxic. So that's a uh, interesting thing to, to keep in mind so that they all take advantage of the apoestic or as the warning coloring um, uh, throughout their lifetime um, and uh, that's part of the process. Now let's look at eight different species of milkweed, all native to North America, and uh, certainly one of these you'll be able to grow where you li live, at least one of these. And we're going to start with the most ubiquitous or the most common, common milkweed. This is Asclepius syrica. I mentioned earlier that it was named syrica because it was mistakenly thought to come from Syria, and obviously it does not. Um, you see these beautiful, highly fragrant clusters of pink flowers in June all the way through August. It takes full sun, moist, well-drained soil. They reach two to four feet. Uh, that's what they say, but I've seen them in, in my own garden reach at least six or seven feet tall. So uh, then only about a foot wide, and they're cold hardy in USDA zones three to nine. Common milkweed is nature's mega food market for insects, and this is the plant that most people associate when they heard, hear the word, word milkweed. 
Uh, more than a 450 insects are known to feed on some portion of the plant. Uh, numerous insects are attracted to these nectar-laden flowers, which are highly, highly fragrant. Um, so these are native to southern Canada and most of the eastern United States, east of the Rockies, excluding the drier parts of the uh, prairies. But this is the most common uh, milkweed and probably one of the most important species to have growing someplace in your garden or in your property because it can be a little uh, weedy, but probably the, uh, the plant that does the most to help uh, the monarchs, both in the nectar that they feed on as the butterflies, as well as the foliage and the leaves that the insect, that the caterpillars ingest uh, going through their five stages of molting. So that is common milkweed. This is a much more delicate looking plant. This is world milkweed or Asclepias verticillata. Uh, these are these white, little, much more dainty clusters, also very fragrant clusters, and very narrow leaves. This blooms uh, from May to September. Um, it's a late bloomer, and it's among the last milkweeds to go dormant. It makes it a very uh, valuable late-season food source for monarch caterpillars and, uh, and the butterflies. Uh, bees, beneficial wasps, butterflies, Skippers all uh, seek the flower's nectar. This is a full sun plant. It will take part shade uh, and does tolerate dry soil. One to about three feet tall, so it's a little bit more diminutive and polite in the garden, and just about a foot or two wide. Cold hardy from zones four to nine. Uh, this is native in most of the eastern United States and Canada, um, east of the Rocky Mountains. So this is the world milkweed. And here, probably familiar to a lot of us, uh, is butterfly weed, uh, a stalwart of the pollinator or the butterfly garden. You can see these bright orange clusters bloom from June to September. And that's on top of a rough, very thin textured uh, leaves that you see here. Yellow cultivars are available. They take full sun, and again, they're also drought tolerant. The flowers are usually orange, but as you can see here, sometimes they're red and yellow. Keep in mind that populations west of the 100th meridian tend to be dominated by yellow colored flowers. East, they tend to be more orange. Uh, and I think that does have to do with the atmosphere and uh, temperatures. But unlike other milkweeds, this one does not contain the milky latex sap. Uh, keep that in mind. Reaches very polite, one to three feet tall, one to two feet wide, cold hardy from zones three to nine, so almost all parts of the country you can grow this. And this is native uh, Ontario to Newfoundland, New England south all the way to Florida, west to Texas, north through Colorado all the way uh, to Minnesota. Um, and that is the familiar butterfly. We do note that those uh, seed heads uh, are much more elongated and much more finger-like than the fatter uh, on the common uh, milkweed. Uh, the same dispersal, er, all of these milkweeds have the same seed dispersal. They'll develop uh, the same seed pods uh, with the downy fluff and the seeds inside. Uh, and we'll get to uh, saving those seeds and growing those seeds for each of these uh, in just a little bit. Here's an unusual one. I don't know. Uh, how familiar this is to most folks, but this is called green milkweed. This is Asclepias viridis, Latin for green. White to green flower clusters, May all the way to August, uh, often just one cluster per plant. And notice that the leaf margins on the plant are often wavy, unlike many of the other milkweeds. But if you uh, get closer inspection on the blossoms, you'll see some rose or purple color that's evident in the center of each of the individual blossoms uh, in a five-pointed star. It makes it quite striking. Uh, but its beauty and its tendency to spread slightly make this actually a great garden choice. Uh, full sun, moist or dry soil, so it's pretty versatile that way, 18 to 24 inches tall and only about a foot to two feet wide. So again, a great choice for the garden. Um, 
cold hardy in USDA zones five to nine. Uh, keep in mind, this is native in south central United States, Nebraska and Texas, east to the Ohio and south all the way to Florida. So think of central uh, southern United States, and this is a, a, a great variety for there. And very striking, I don't think there's a lot of flowers that uh, bloom green. And again, this is also a, a very fragrant blossom as well. And here's a real curious uh, milkweed. It's called antelope horns uh, milkweed. It's Asclepias asperula, and it has this glorious uh, blossom that's actually hard to take your eyes off of. They're green yellow flowers tinged with that bit of maroon, and it gives way to that seed pod that curves, and people think they actually resemble antelope horns. Uh, it blooms uh, March all the way to October, and obviously then the, um, the seed heads uh, develop. Um, when the seed pods are ripe, uh, some people think they resemble a whole herd of antelopes resting out among the grasses or in the prairie. Uh, but don't confuse this plant with the green milkweed, uh, which we just talked about, which does best in the south, uh, east and south central United States and the Midwest. Uh, this it takes full sun, uh, dry sandy soil, one to two feet tall and two to three feet wide cold hardy in USDA zones five to 10. Um, also again, highly fragrant uh, blossom and native from central Kansas to Texas and Mexico, west to South Idaho and Southeast California. So again, this is one of those more Southwestern uh, um, species that's appropriate for folks who live, live in those parts of the country. Next, we have swamp milkweed. This sh should be pretty familiar uh, to most folks. And again, this is the one that takes it wetter or can take wet, uh, muckier uh, conditions than many of the other. So if you tend to have a garden that holds moisture, this is most certainly one of the milkweeds you want to look at. But this is uh, swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. Uh, deep rose pink flowers. Uh, bloom from June all the way to October on very narrow leaved branching stems that you can see here. Um, it takes full sun and actually can uh, take some part shade. And as we said, it does prefer wetter soils, reaches about three to five feet tall, maybe two to three feet wide and cold hardy in zones uh, three to six. Um, the juice of this wetland milkweed is less milky than that of some of the other species. Um, these are actually, some people think, sort of cinnamon scented. Uh, and these are the, uh, the, uh, these umbrals that appear in summer are composed actually of many tiny star-shaped florets, little tiny flowers. And the intricate florets look actually almost like little freshly extruded pink cake decorations like on a, a mountain laurel or, or a calmia. Uh, but not just the monarch benefits from the swamp milkweed, red admiral butterflies, American lady, painted ladies, swallowtails, fritillaries, uh, even hair streak butterflies, uh, along with bumblebees, honeybees, hummingbird moths, and hummingbirds uh, seek out the nectar from these clusters of blossoms. Uh, as I said, full sun to part shade, moist to wet soils, um, and cold hardy in zones uh, three to six. Swamp milkweed is widely distributed across the United States and Canada, uh, from Quebec and Maine, south to Florida and Texas, and all the way west to Nevada and Idaho. Um, so keep swamp milkweed in mind. And this is showy milkweed, and you can see from those very large showy blossoms, how it gets its name. This is Asclepias speciosa. And notice those pink flowers at the top of the stem uh, at, and on the leaf axils, they bloom from May all the way to September. Um, this species is closely related to the common milkweed, uh, Asclepias syrica which is sometimes hybridizes with and the eastern limits of its distribution. And these species are similar in appearance and growth. Both They're both tall and they're robust. But the, you can distinguish them by uh, this one, the speciosa, has fine white hairs that you can um, 
just to almost detect on these leaves here. And they also have those same hairs on the flowers uh, uh, that look almost like little crowns if you look closely. Again, this is full sun. It uh, does like moist, well-drained soils, two to four feet tall, about a foot or two wide, uh, cold hardy in zones three to nine. This uh, showy milkweed is native to the western half of the United States and Canada. So again, this is one of those species for our folks on the west coast and on the other side of the Rockies uh, to consider uh, that will do well. There's seven, and here is our eighth and final one, and this is California milkweed, and you can notice how distinctively different this is uh, with its woolly, uh, fuzzy, foliage and blossoms. These are, you notice how deeply purple uh, these blossoms are. It blooms uh, May to July on this white woolly foliage. Uh, California milkweeds uh, go dormant in fall and when they go dormant they trigger the monarch butterflies uh, to begin their migration south uh, and on schedule. Um, alkaloids from the wrong milkweed uh, say of a South American or Mexican uh, species, can expose the butterflies to predation. If the monarch or other butterflies has evolved with the milkweed, they may have limited tolerance for the particular alkaloid or latex of, the, of a plant species. Uh, so it's actually interesting that regionally, the monarchs in the different regions have developed uh, different tolerances to the level of toxicity of the different milkweed. So I know that's geeking out a little bit, but it's an uh, uh, interesting fact to keep in mind. Full sun, dry soil, uh, these reach three to four feet tall, maybe one to five feet wide, and they're cold hardy in zones seven to nine. So this is one of those warmer species for warmer parts. And again, this is native to all of the southwestern and southern California, southwestern United States and uh, California. So those, eight, those are eight of the ones uh, uh, that I hope you uh, are inspired to try growing in your garden. Now let's talk about milkweed seeds. Uh, and for the most part, for all the species that we just discussed, the development of the seeds will be the same. All of these after the blossom will develop the seed heads inside of which will develop 50 to 100 seeds, each with its fluffy parachute when it opens to be dispersed by the wind. Um, and here you can see this is the common milkweed Asclepias sirica, and you can see different stages of the seed pods opening. When the, dry, the dried pod is just beginning to split open is a great time if you want to harvest and collect that seeds, which we'll get to in just a minute. But once that floss uh, fluffs out, it's harder to remove the seeds. So keep in mind that right when they just begin to open is a great time to remove those seeds from actually from the fluff. Um, to remove the seeds, open up the pod carefully and remove just the seeds. They'll separate very easily from that silky uh, down you'll see in there. Uh, grip the floss into the clusters with one hand and gently just remove the seeds uh, and the floss from the other hand. Um, let those seeds dry for about a week. They'll need to be, if you don't plant them in the fall, they'll need to be stratified or chilled. So that means you'll need to put them uh, in a cool, dry spot like the refrigerator uh, for a few weeks before planting out in spring. Um, they'll need to be in a, you store them in an envelope or in a plastic baggie. Uh, it has to be about 40 degrees um, before you're ready to plant those out in the spring. So. Uh, planting those seeds out, it, it couldn't be easier. You can actually just scatter them where you want them to grow in the garden, water and pat them in place uh, is the easiest way, or you can let them fall where they will in the uh, fall and uh, grow uh, where the seeds have fallen and get naturally stratified by winter's uh, cold temperatures. Um, you can plant them here. You can see this is when you're taking it and planting it very specifically where you want it to grow in the garden. So as I said, uh, they will have need needed to be chilled. You can uh, sprinkle them on well-tilled soil and um, add a, trop to a, a top dressing of soil and water them in and you're good to go. Uh, you can also purchase plugs. They are available. 
uh, and it's a much faster way to get a head start on the season. So if you're planning on planting a big patch, this may be the route you want to go is to actually look for a source for milkweed plugs. And there are a lot of sources for uh, native milkweeds out there. And here are some of the ones uh, that can help you. High Country Gardens, Prairie Moon Nursery, uh, Prairie Nursery, and also the Xerces Society is a great source to find seed uh, for the area in which you live. A little about using milkweed in the garden. Keep in mind that milkweed has a long taproot and doesn't like to be transplanted. So you're going to want to sow that plug or that seed where you want it to actually grow in the garden. Um, and it doesn't have to be relegated to just a, a milkweed patch in your garden. A lot of these plants have great ornamental value and combine really lovely with other plants, especially for a pollinator garden uh, that you may see here. And also many cultivars, and you can see this is a uh, yellow cultivar on the right of swamp milkweed, uh, make great foils uh, for many brighter performing uh, boulder plants in the sunny border. And also, great stands can be a, create a great foliage effect in the garden and become actually a vast habitat uh, within the garden that is garden-worthy in ornamental gardens and not just in, uh, obviously, in uh, pollinator gardens uh, like you see here. They combine well with uh, ornamental grasses um, and there should be a species uh, th th that uh, maybe resonates for you, that you've got some spot in your garden that has just enough room uh, to have one more plant in there that can help the monarchs. All of the information that we've covered today is available. You'll see there's PDF resources that you can download and hold on to or print out to keep for all this information about, uh, we actually will have more information on the eight different uh, species that we covered, uh, a map to where the, they grow in North America, the United States and Canada is covered in there, as well as resources about planting and growing and stratifying those seeds. So be sure to check out uh, the resources that are available with the seminar uh, and keep track of that. I also. Uh, want to mention a few books that have been great resources for me. This is a new book. This is Raising Butterflies in the Garden from Firefly Fly Press. Uh, really useful, brand new book that just came out this year uh, about supporting all different kinds of butterflies in the home garden. And this is one of my favorite books and has been for a long time. This is by Judy Burris and Wayne Richards. This is Life Cycles of Butterflies. This is a great resources resource for families. It goes through most of the major different types of butterflies in North America and every single stage of their life. So if you're seeing that chrysalis or that caterpillar, uh, you can identify actually which butterfly uh, you're, you're looking at in that. Here's another new book from my friend Barbara Ellis. This is Attracting Birds and Butterflies, How to Plant a Backyard Habitat to Attract Winged Wildlife. Uh, and this is by my old friend uh, Barbara Ellis and that just, this is a new edition that just came out this year as well. Uh, but for a really deep dive, uh, this is probably one of the best resources. This is Monarchs and Milkweed from Princeton Architectural Press. Uh, its subtitle is A Migrating Butterfly, a Poisonous Plant, and Their Remarkable Story of Coevolution. Really valuable deep dive for anybody who wants to, to find out more about this subject, and we couldn't recommend it more.